Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to see so many of you here tonight. What a treat. Uh, my name's Carol Alman morton I'm the executive director of OLLI at Berkshire Community College. And I'm just up here for a, a brief moment to just say that it is my pleasure to see you all here tonight and to introduce Ellen Kennedy, president of Berkshire Community College and one of our biggest supporters, probably our biggest supporter. Uh, and welcome to Ellen. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the 15th Mona Sherman Memorial Lecture with an engaging, forthright, riveting, and very healthy Congressman, maybe Senator, Jamie Raskin. Yeah, give it up. We are so pleased that you could join us this evening. Ollie at BCC is growing and strong. We are excited for the next year of programming and about the ongoing opportunities for broke programming that connects members of the Ollie at Berkshire Community College community with the college and our wonderful community. So you may be wondering why I'm wearing my regalia. Perhaps it is to forward promote Berkshire Community College's commencement this coming Friday at 4.30 at Tanglewood. It's open to all and a really wonderful and moving experience. But no, it is for another reason. The Berkshire Community College Board of Trustees is privileged to award honorary associate degrees to individuals recognizing outstanding service or accomplishments of the individuals who have positively impacted the college and community. This is the highest award the Board of Trustees may grant. For this reason, it is highly selective and is granted in the rarest of occasions. Today, we are honored to present a posthumous honorary degree to Mona Sherman. I would like to invite out Mona's, yeah. I would like to invite out Mona's daughter, Lisa Shackey, and granddaughter, Casey Gleischer, to join me at the stage to receive the degree on her behalf from a very wonderful person presenting it. We are here today in this theater because of Mona Sherman. <laughs> you can see you're getting a standing O. I told him he was beloved here. Um, we are here today in this theater because of Mona Sherman and her family. Ollie at Berkshire Community College is here today in large part due to the work of Mona and her husband, Art Sherman. Yeah. Mona Sherman was a successful fashion executive having served as president of divisions of Anne Klein and Perry Ellis prior to retiring with Arthur Sherman to the Berkshires where for 30 years she was active in many areas of the community. She chaired the volunteers and became a corporator of the Berkshire Museum, joining the Berkshire Institute for Lifelong Learning, affectionately known as Bill. Shortly after retiring, she became a significant force in the growth and development of the organization, holding numerous positions on the board of directors, chairing many committees, and introducing many innovative programs, including this one, prior to it being named for her. She was a key factor in securing for the organization an important affiliation with the OSHA Foundation and the merger of Bill into Berkshire Community College as the OSHA Lifelong Institute, OLLI, at Berkshire Community College. It was Mona who called the Bernard OSHA Foundation from the road in the car with art after learning about the OLLI network and grant opportunities starting the ball rolling. She connected with our educational partners to support our application, and after lots of work and negotiating, Bill became Ollie at BCC. Following her presidency of Bill, Mona con continued to serve on several committees and the board of Ollie at BCC, as well as as its president. Her curiosity, energy, and interests were endless, and she always was always on the move among the many cultural organizations in the area. This is the 15th Mona Sherman Memorial Lecture, established to honor her memory after her untimely death in 2008. Mona was a dynamic business person and volunteer leader who played a transformative role in the growth and expansion of Ollie at BCC. 
the lecture series established with the generosity of her family and friends honors both her love of the Berkshires as a community and of lifelong learning. So today, we bestow upon Mona Sherman an honorary associate's degree in arts posthumously. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to Mona and to her family for their commitment to lifelong learning, higher education, and community engagement. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't see down there, but my, uh, my daughter, Casey, is going to be presenting this to my stepdad, Art, and there she comes. Casey, there, all right. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Great Barrington. We are so excited to be here again. And, um, you know, this is a monumental night. I'm very choked up that my mom um, is receiving this really beautiful honor. The day she died, October 15, 2008, as a family, we were highly traumatized. It happened, you know, suddenly. And really, within a few hours, we had this thought. Let's name a lecture series in her memory, in her honor. And um, we wanted to just be able to give back to all of you, to the community that she loved so dearly. And we wanted to make sure that the lecture was free of charge. She had initiated the lecture series, as Ellen just said. And both she and Art had served separate terms as president. And, and then looking back over these 15 years, just incredible to see how many people have graced the stage from Mika Brzezinski to Mike Barnacle to Joe Klein to Jim Acosta, and of course, we're gonna get Jamie Raskin again tonight, and we're really thrilled about that. And this has really become like the kickoff of the summer season in the Berkshires. And so, you know, because mom was such an intellectual, you probably wouldn't realize that she was also a teenage bride. She was attending Syracuse University in the 1950s, and she was 19 years old, and she went off and she got married. And um, growing up, I'm the oldest of her three daughters, and she always used to say to us, girls, do not get your MRS degree. <laughs> you know, please prioritize education. It's the most important thing. I got my MRS degree. I wish I had finished college. I wish I got my college degree, and she didn't. And so we know wherever she is right now, she's walking up to this podium. She's accepting the degree with her cap and gown. She probably would have embellished it with some fabulous, you know, fashionable embellishments. Um, and she would have been so excited for this honor and this recognition from President Kennedy at Berkshire Community College and Congressman Jamie Raskin. And really in a full circle moment, my sister Tina Sharkey is now faculty at USC, uh, entrepreneur in residence and an adjunct professor at the Ivan and Young Academy at the University of Southern California. And this year I had the great honor to be an official guest lecturer alongside a professor in the English department at Washington University in St. Louis, my alma mater. And my sister Pamela is also certified in all sorts of healing arts and is in the middle of opening up a healing center after her college degree in which she graduated with Latin honors. So um, we thought it would really be a true gift to have this come full circle, to have mom you know, achieve something that she absolutely missed out on and always talked about during our childhood. So Jamie Raskin is back here tonight and we are just so honored. As many of you may know, we published his number one best-selling memoir, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy in hardcover back in January 2022, um, right around the one-year anniversary of the insurrection. It became the biggest book in the industry. It was the number one bestseller. And now it's come out in paperback. And we have copies for you guys that uh, Congressman Raskin will sign. Um, Congressman Raskin also wrote the afterword to the January 6th committee report. And we also have that back there for you guys to sign. So after Jamie delivers his lecture and after he answers your questions and feel free to ask anything you want, 
please do that, um, but then wait around and he can, he can sign your books. Um, I also want to take time to just thank a few members of the community here, um, in particular Ollie and its director Carol Almond morton and Judith Weiner. They've been instrumental in helping. And then the great staff at the Mahewi, especially a director, executive director Janice Martinson and, and technology wizard Lucas Pulaski, who has been really helpful with tonight's video and large screen presentations, which you will soon see. Um, of course, Berkshire Gas, which is one of our sponsors, and the Berkshire Eagle, and its wonderful publisher, Fred Rutberg. And if you haven't gotten your copy of the Berkshire Eagle today, we have a whole page. One article is an interview with Jamie Raskin, and the other is an article about mom. And I want to thank Clarence Fanto for his tremendous writing. Um, Ari Melber, a lawyer, journalist, and host of The Beat on MSNBC, he was our original speaker tonight, and he um, was meant to have been introduced by Congressman Raskin, but due to a family matter, actually, the MSNBC host and chief legal correspondent is coming to us via videotape in a direct message to all of you. So, as they say on MSNBC, let's go to the videotape. Hey there, this is Ari Melber from MSNBC, and I wanted to greet everyone here for this Mona Sherman lecture and take an opportunity to introduce or shout out Congressman Jamie Raskin. He is someone that we have all learned about during this period in America, an impeachment manager, of course, known for his service on the January 6th committee, which has been an important project that we've been covering in the news and something we sometimes need nowadays an actual expert on the law, a law professor as well. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this virtual announcement uh, of introducing him, and I hope this lecture is valuable to everyone in the room and beyond. I, I wanna thank Lisa Sharkey, who I've been working with on this, because hopefully I will be able to see you all in person next year as well. So that is our hello from over here on the beat. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Congressman Jamie Raskin. Hey everybody, thank you Ari Melber, thank you guys, thank you Lisa Sharkey, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here as Ari Melber's understudy and substitute tonight, I'm thrilled to be uh, back with the people from Ali, uh, we're staying in uh, Stockbridge and somebody came up to me and asked what I was doing in town, I said I came to to do the uh, Mona Sherman lecture with Ollie, and she said, Ollie, that's a bunch of like super overeducated liberals. You don't need to talk to them. Uh, that's, they're, they're, uh, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I said, I like preaching to the choir. That's my favorite place to preach. Um, so um, it's great to be back in Massachusetts with President Kennedy, uh, always, and uh, um, I love your beautiful commonwealth. I was thinking about, um, about Thomas Jefferson, who, when he was living in France as ambassador over there, he used to say um, that everybody on earth who loves freedom has two countries, his or her own, and France. And I was thinking everybody in America who loves democracy has two states, his or her own, and Massachusetts. Uh, uh, so I'm psyched to be with you guys tonight. Um, and, um, um, uh, well, uh, settle in because I've come a long way from the free state of Maryland and I got some stuff to say and, uh, and I, uh, was once a state senator, so I knew how to filibuster and, uh, um, so I'm talking tonight about, uh, constitutional democracy versus insurrectionism. And, uh, I should say... Uh, I'm here as a true blue Democrat, but I want to speak to people across the political spectrum, so I thought I would begin my remarks by invoking our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, who, uh, <laughs> sp um, who spoke of uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And this is uh, the tantalizing and always elusive dream of America. But if you read the Constitution the way that I do, you will see that the vast majority of the constitutional amendments that we've added since the original Bill of Rights have been suffrage expanding, democracy deepening amendments. So the 13th Amendment 
abolished slavery, and the 14th Amendment gave us equal protection and due process, and the 15th Amendment banned race discrimination in voting, and the 17th Amendment shifted the mode of election of the U.S. Senators from the legislatures to the people, and the 19th Amendment uh, doubled the franchise in America by passing women's suffrage, and uh, the 23rd Amendment gave people in Washington, D.C. the right to participate in presidential elections at least. The 24th Amendment banned poll taxes, dismantling a huge barrier to political participation. The 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. You see, the whole trajectory of our constitutional development has been towards a more perfect union by the expansion of democracy. Sometimes my uh, distinguished friends across the aisle will get up and say, well, you know, Raskin keeps talking about democracy, but we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And they think, you know, they really got me with that one. Uh, but, you know, a, a republic is just a representative democracy because not everybody can operate on the town hall principle where everybody comes together and decides everything together. I'm sure that's how things happen here in Great Barrington, actually, um, but in a lot of the New England towns. But a, but a republic is just a representative democracy, and our representative democracy has grown ever more democratic through American history, and there are a lot of people invested in denying the fact that we are an aspiring and ambitious democracy, but that's what we are, the world's greatest multiracial, multi-ethnic constitutional democracy that's ever existed, even with everything we've been dealing with over the last few years. So if the search for democracy has been the motor force of our constitutional development, then white supremacist insurrection has been the undertow in our history, obstructing democratic prog progress and dragging us down into lower forms of government and political organization, uh, like autocracy and kleptocracy and plutocracy and theocracy. So I want to um, show you tonight that the struggle going on in America today is between constitutional democracy and Donald Trump's MAGA-style insurrectionism and authoritarianism. And to see the dynamics of this fight, you need look no further than the current struggle going on even this weekend over whether the MAGA extremists who've commandeered the Republican Party will be able to plunge our country into default economic crisis and mass unemployment if we don't give in to their demands to swing a wrecking ball at veterans programs, education, SNAP, nutrition, healthcare, environmental protection, and essentially every other form of public spending other than military spending. And um, Florida Representative Matt Gates gave the game away this week when he told Speaker McCarthy not to budge from the GOP proposals um, in talking to President Biden because he said, we shouldn't negotiate with our hostage. Um, now the hostage there of course is the American people and the American constitution. Um, and this uh, legislative hostage taking is not just a pathological departure from two centuries of American politics and government threatening a default for the very first time in our history but it's also an effort to violate the Constitution in a way that is totally fundamental to American insurrectionism. Now, if you'd go to slide one, um, my friend Lucas, if you're out there. Um, it is up there, okay, good. Um, section four of the 14th Amendment says that the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. And that's the principle which should be framing this entire debate. The 14th Amendment is not an option, as the press keeps saying, should the president exercise the 14th Amendment option. It's a mandate, and it's the whole context within which we have to be examining this whole struggle that's taking place. Congress has passed dozens of spending statutes, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, um, as well as statutes uh, providing for federal borrowing uh, under Title 31. And the president's job under Article Two of the Constitution is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. But now Kevin McCarthy and his team are saying that 
the Liberty Bond Act of 1917, which is the source of the debt ceiling um, that they now wield like a dagger at the throat of the Republic, um, means that um, the president must accept everything they're telling him to do or else uh, they will force the country into its first default ever. But I would argue, and I think it's perfectly clear from the Constitution, that President Biden has a responsibility to enforce all of those spending laws, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and to meet uh, the contractual obligations of dealing with the bondholders of the country. Um, and all of those are a massive statutory mandate on the president who takes care that the laws are faithfully executed. Um, and against all of that, they say, well, there's this one law which they describe as a debt ceiling which would prevent the president from meeting all of these other laws. Well, even if you accept that that's what that statute means, and I don't, but even if you accepted that, then you would say, well, in the conflict between all these other laws and that law, why don't we look at the Constitution, which says the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. And in that case, um, it makes it perfectly clear that if forced to the edge, the president must go ahead and make the payments to those uh, people who are owed money under our Constitution and under our statutes. Now, um, what is the history of this Section 4 of the 14th Amendment? Um, well, during the Civil War, uh, President Lincoln and the Republicans had to increase the federal debt 80 times in order to pay for the war. And President Lincoln committed both to private entities, but also to states that were putting up money and whose uh, people were serving in the war, that their debts would be made, either money they put up uh, ahead of time or the bonuses and the pensions that were owed to the Civil War, Civil War soldiers. And when the Southern states re-entered the Union, they quickly began talking about repudiating the debt that President Lincoln had uh, incurred in the course of prosecuting the Civil War. And the pro-Union forces said that they would never repudiate the debts that were uh, incurred during the course of the Civil War. And moreover, it should never be a question of partisan contest whether the country would pay the lawful debts that the government had engaged in. And thus, that's the genesis of this provision, which says not only the validity of the public debts, including the bonuses and pensions owed to people who served in the war against insurrection, are owed, but also that no money should ever be paid to anybody who ever engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the Republic. And so for me, this whole problem that the country's been obsessing about over the last several weeks is easily synthesized and resolved by one thing that President Lincoln said during the Civil War. And he dispatched federal troops to, um, to my home state, of Maryland in order to make certain that the certain uh, Maryland state senators would not vote to secede from the union. And he suspended habeas corpus in the area between the District of Columbia and Pennsylvania in Maryland. And uh, when he was attacked for this, he said um, that it was the choice between circumnavigating the habeas corpus provision, which is actually in the Constitution, not, not even a statute, but a provision in the Constitution. It's a choice between that and essentially letting all of the laws in the Constitution collapse. Lincoln said this, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated? And so he proceeded to, um, to suspend habeas corpus in order to save the union. And I think uh, President uh, Biden would be engaged in far less dramatic action simply to say he's going to pay the Social Security recipients, he's going to pay the Medicare recipients, he's going to pay the bondholders of the country. All of those laws need to be enforced because the Constitution uh, requires it. So. Um, 
Look, the problem of insurrection's been with us for a very long time. Uh, Hamilton warned of it, actually, in the very first Federalist paper, um, where he said that uh, opportunistic political operators would pander to the violent passions of the mob in order to usurp power and then destroy the freedoms of the people. These cult leaders would begin, he said, as demagogues and end as tyrants. Um, and um, in 1838, in his famous Lyceum Address, delivered after the murder of abolitionist newspaper editor Elijah Lovejoy in Alton, Illinois, by a racist mob, Abraham Lincoln, denounced mob violence. He observed that if destruction ever came to America, it would not come from transatlantic military powers. It would come from within our own country. And when the Confederate rebellion against the Union did come, Lincoln sent a message to Congress on December the 3rd, 1861, in which he described insurrection as a war upon the very first principle of democratic government, which is the people get to choose their own leaders, their own officials. Well, as you know, insurrectionism is back again today. It exploded in our face January 6, 2021 when a demagogue galvanized a violent mob to block the peaceful transfer of power and to try to install the loser as the winner of the presidential election. More than 1,000 people have been charged with crimes in connection with this insurrectionary attack. More than 600 have already been convicted or pled guilty to a wide range of offenses um, from assaulting federal officers all the way to seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow or put down the government of the United States. Uh, you may have seen uh, yesterday that um, Stuart Rhodes, Yale Law School graduate and uh, the leader of the Oath Keepers was sentenced to 18 years in prison for his seditious conspiracy for leading the conspiracy to overthrow the government. Now, I want to talk not just about the practice of insurrection, which is obviously alive and well, but the theory of insurrection, um, which operates as a justification for unlimited availability of firearms in America and an excuse for 24-7 gun violence in our country. Now, if we go to slide number two, Everybody knows the First Amendment protects the freedom of speech, the right to petition government for redress of grievances, the right to assemble. The question is whether the Second Amendment gives people who've peacefully assembled the right to take up arms against the government and then engage in violence against the police to overthrow government or a governmental process like the peaceful transfer of power, which they consider tyrannical or illegitimate. Now, the Second Amendment, as you know, says nothing about that. The Second Amendment says nothing about insurrection, says nothing about rebellion, it simply says uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but doesn't say anything about overthrowing the government. And yet, mega Republicans, indeed most Republicans, who speak on this in the House or the Senate say yes, the Second Amendment gives the people the right to overthrow the government. If you'd go to, um, uh, I think it's slide number three, um, I've assembled just a few quotes I found from some of my colleagues. I just remembered. Um, so Matt Gates says the Second Amendment is about maintaining within the citizenry the ability to maintain an armed rebellion against the government if that becomes necessary. Um, Lauren Boebert says the Second Amendment has nothing to do with hunting unless you're talking about hunting tyrants. Um, and Chip Roy, um, who's probably the, the most sophisticated of the insurrectionist school, says that, um, that the Second Amendment is designed purposefully to empower the people to be able to resist the force of tyranny used against them, which of course uh, means that the people have to have the right to obtain an arsenal equal to whatever the government has. So now today, of course, the people, uh, broadly construed, have more than 400 million firearms, which dwarfs the number of firearms possessed by every branch of the uh, military put together. But Chip Roy's argument also goes to 
the, um, the, the quality of the weapon. So if you're going to fight the government and you're going to overthrow the government because you have the right to do that, then it's not just a, a rifle that you need to have, which the Supreme Court said in Heller versus District of Columbia, you've got the right to get for hunting and recreation. It's not just a handgun you have a right to, which the court in Heller said you have a right to get for the purposes of self-defense. Okay, that was Heller in 2008. Chip Roy and my colleagues go way beyond that. They say, basically, you have the right to every form of weaponry that the government has. So that's why we have people walking down the street with AR-15s, because they're just exercising their Second Amendment right to possess a weapon that would allow them to overthrow the government if the government turned tyrannical against them in their view, and they decided to do that. Now, this theory obviously completely neutralizes and vaporizes our ability to, to pass the reasonable gun safety measures that we need to protect against the random gun violence that is um, wrecking the social contract in America. Uh, in 2023, we have seen more mass shootings than we have seen days. That means, on average, every day there is a mass shooting and a half or two mass shootings all over the country, whether it's in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, or Louisville, Kentucky, or Buffalo, New York, or Uvalde, Texas, you name it. Um, the, the country is absolutely wrecked with the gun violence. But if the people have a right to have whatever weapons they want, essentially, and I'm not quite sure why the argument doesn't extend to neutron bombs and nuclear weapons, because uh, those are arms too, um, but basically, you can buy weapons of war freely at gun shows um, without even a background check online, without even a background check or in a private gun sale. Um, all of that is justified by this insurrectionist theory of the Second Amendment. So it's a very big deal what they're saying, what has become the dogma, not just of the National Rifle Association, but also of President Lincoln's party. Uh, which it gives me no joy to tell you, has become an authoritarian cult of personality um, and yet has now swallowed this dogma whole. So I want to examine this claim that the Constitution protects our right to overthrow the government, which uh, has a stranglehold over not just the GOP, but millions and millions of people in the country who now believe this. Let's start with this basic reality check because we just had an insurrection uh, on January 6, 2021. Of the more than 1,000 prosecutions brought and the hundreds of convictions that have been obtained, do you know how many of those prosecutions have been voided out or how many of the convictions uh, have been overturned on the basis that the defendant had a constitutional right to overthrow the government. Zero, right? None of them have. So just to reground everybody in reality, if it were true that you had a right to try to overthrow the government, you would think that some of these convictions would be thrown out, but none of them, in fact, have been. But I, w I propose to show you exactly how at odds this is with the actual text um, and structure and meaning of our Constitution. So go to slide number four for a second. Um, the Constitution treats insurrection and rebellion not as some kind of uh, reserved constitutional right of the people, but rather as a constitutional crime, which the Constitution mobilizes against. So in, um, I think we're at slide four, um, Article One, Section 8, Clause 15, gives Congress the power to provide for calling forth the militia from the states in order to suppress insurrections and repel invasions. Okay, that's right there in Article 1, Section 8, which enumerates the powers of Congress. So think about that for a second. They say the Constitution gives you the right to all the firearms you want in order to wage insurrection against the government, and that the people form some kind of improvised, spontaneous militia to overthrow the government. But 
Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says Congress can call forth the actual militias from the states in order to suppress insurrections. Now, which is it? Those are obviously two uh, mutually exclusive possibilities, right? Well, here's some more ammunition. Look at slide five. The Republican Guarantee Clause in Article 4, Section 4, providing the United States shall guarantee to the people of the states a Republican form of government. And by the way, that's not a capital R Republican Party form of government. Um, that's a representative form of government. Um, and protect each state's government and the people against invasion and domestic violence. So how could you have a constitutional right to engage in domestic violence against the government if you're unhappy with it, while the Congress has to guarantee to the state governments and the people of the states that they will assist, that the Congress will assist the states in putting down domestic violence, which is considered a lethal threat to representative government and not some kind of viable constitutional alternative to it. Both of these um, provisions inst incidentally became part of the Constitution because of Shays' Rebellion, which I know took place in the neighborhood here. I think it was, uh, it was headquartered in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. The founders emphatically rejected and put down the idea that if you're unhappy with the government, the way you deal with that is to gather bands of citizens with arms to attack the government. The militia, which the insurrectionists like to imagine exists as the people's reserve organic power to fight the government is actually the well-organized instrument by which both state and federal governments have suppressed insurrections and which Congress can call into service, service at any point to oppose domestic violence. Check out slide six, um, which defines what the militia is. Um, a lot of the people who came to attack us on January 6th said that they were just a popular militia and therefore were untouchable uh, by the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police. Um, and they would have been untouchable by the National Guard had Donald Trump actually sent them into service, uh, but he didn't. Um, well, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 reserves to the states the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. In other words, the militias are the admixture product of the training by the state governments, the identification of officers by the state governments, and then the discipline and the rules imposed by Congress, which continues to have the power to call the militias into action. And this is how we come to have what the Second Amendment calls for, a well-regulated militia. And a well-regulated militia is one that does not show up at an elementary school and start murdering children. That's not what a well-regulated militia is for. Sometimes my colleagues will get up on the floor of the house, they say, Raskin wants to repeal the Second Amendment. And I say, no, I don't want you to repeal the Second Amendment. I want you to read the Second Amendment, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm asking for. Um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized that a well-regulated militia means well-regulated by the government. And as long ago as 1886, the court upheld a state law, this one from Illinois, banning all private militias. Today, all 50 states ban private militias, um, which are laws that are obviously completely antithetical to the idea that anybody can form a militia, the Proud Boys militia, the Oath Keepers militia, and then just decide to overthrow the government. So it's gotta be one way or the other. Um, and I will go further on this point. If you go to slide seven, um, far from being some kind of civic duty, raising arms against the government when it goes far enough is the definition of treason. This is Article 3, Section 3, Clause 1. And this is the only place in the Constitution, by the way, where a crime is actually defined. Treason against the United States, it says, shall consist only in levying war against them or adhering to their enemies. Well, what is levying, what is committing violence against the police and the government in order to overthrow an election or dismantle a constitutional process other than levying war against the United States? There's no ambiguity anywhere in the Constitution about this. My favorite example 
and I'm mercifully omitting five or six others, but I'll show you one more. Check out slide number eight. This is my favorite. Um, after the Civil War, participation in armed rebellion um, or insurrection was made grounds for excluding someone from federal or state office. If you swore an oath to uphold your office and you violated, you can never hold federal or state office again. Um, So if we've got all of this overwhelming evidence right there in the body of the Constitution, I've spared you all most of the Supreme Court case law on this, but you can imagine uh, during the Civil War, there were a lot of cases about this, and not a single one said that there was a right of insurrection or secession or disunion, okay? Um, so in the face of this overwhelming rejection of a right to insurrection in the Constitution. How do my colleagues respond when I try to point these things uh, out to them? How do they uh, maintain that the Second Amendment or anywhere else in the Constitution in invisible ink somehow protects uh, the right of insurrection? Well, um, they, they, there's no uh, originalist legislative history that helps. You can't find any uh, quotes to this effect in the Constitutional uh, Convention or the state ratifying conventions or in the Federalist Papers. There's nothing there. So it really comes down to two things that they will say. One, they will stand up um, and usually quoting the Patrick Henry Professor of Second Amendment Law from the uh, Antonin Scalia School of Law at George Mason, they will say, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, which undoubtedly he did. Um, that's a slogan. It's not in the Constitution. But in any event, Patrick Henry was um, a Virginian and an anti-federalist who voted against the Constitution. Okay, so it seems odd to turn to him to help us interpret the meaning of the Constitution. Um, they kind of leave it at that. Um, and then in the final analysis, what they will say more plausibly, but still erroneously, well, the Declaration of Independence, you know, starts off when in the course of human events and so on, uh, a government turns tyrannical, there's a right to dissolve those bands of political union and the, um, the American colonists engaged in revolution. Right they are about that. But when the American revolutionaries engaged in the revolution, they did not cite the Magna Carta or the British Constitution for the right to engage in the revolution. The revolutionaries invoked natural law, saying that anybody has the right to overthrow a government which is alien to the rights of the people, that's violating the rights of the people. It would have been ridiculous to cite the Magna Carta or the British law or British constitution for that proposition. Um, in fact, if you, uh, there's a beautiful quote from Lincoln about this um, that uh, is in his first inaugural address where he stated that, should the people grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending the Constitution or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. But the revolutionary right is, by definition, Lincoln said, not a constitutional right because, as he put it, no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination, it being impossible to destroy it except by some action not provided for in the instrument itself. So if you want to overthrow the government of the United States, if you think that the presidential election of 2020, which Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, if you believe that that was a fraudulent election, if you believe the government has turned tyrannical, yes, you have every right in the world to exercise what you think is your natural right to overthrow the government, but you do that on your own time, on your own dime. Don't cite our Constitution, and if you attack our police officers and our National Guard officers and our local police officers and you lose, you're gonna go to jail. 
in, in our system of government, okay? And uh, I, I know that Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert described the people in prison uh, in Washington, D.C. today for assaulting federal officers and for engaging in seditious conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States as political prisoners like Nelson Mandela or Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, people who were fighting authoritarian regimes who were violating the rule of law and human rights. Um, but they're not political prisoners. They're just prisoners because of what they've done. Now, Donald Trump is running around the country saying he will pardon them, despite the fact that his lawyers, sitting five feet away from me in the impeachment trial in the Senate, said that none of them would ever have a single positive word to say about any of the people who tried to overthrow the government that day. And yet, uh, Donald Trump is out there saying that he is going to pardon these people. They've been treated so unfairly. They're patriots and so on. And yesterday, Governor DeSantis said that uh, he too would um, consider uh, pardoning the January 6th insurrectionists. Um, and of course, uh, Pres uh, former President Trump has also said that the upshot of any criminal indictment that he now faces will likely be death and destruction, uh, further extending the chaos that he has tried uh, from the very beginning to inject into the political and constitutional processes of the country. You can see the wisdom of the framers of the 14th Amendment who said, if you swear an oath to uphold the Constitution and you violate it, you shall never hold public office again. That's a, that's a provision we need to take seriously. So, my friends, um, the fraudulent constitutional philosophy of insurrectionism um, is exacting a brutal toll on the American people and our social contact, uh, contract by blockading reasonable, perfectly constitutional gun safety measures. If you go back and read Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller versus District of Columbia, he said the right to the handgun and the rifle um, are built into the Second Amendment, but there's no right to procure other weapons that are outside of that historical mainstream, much less is there a right to obtain any weapon without going through a background check, and that the local and state governments always have a right to practice reasonable gun safety measures. That was Justice Scalia for the conservative majority in Heller, five to four. There were four justices who said, we shouldn't even be talking about individual rights because the right to possess a firearm is only in connection with participating in a well-regulated militia. Well, the majority didn't go with that. They said that it is a right that belongs to everybody, but it is limited to the handgun and to the rifle for hunting and recreation, which would allow us all of the leeway that we need to pass a universal violent criminal background check in the United States of America, okay? Close the loopholes in the Brady Law. Close the online internet loophole. Close the private gun show loophole, close the loophole for private sales, millions of firearms being transacted without any background check. Um, we have all the room we need within the Heller decision to pass once again the ban on military style assault weapons in the streets, in the towns, in the cities of America. The whole purpose of the social contract I don't know whether the young people read uh, the social contract theorists anymore in school, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and Rousseau, but the whole purpose of the social contract is that we will be safer within a society with laws than we will be out in the state of nature, which Hobbes famously described as a state of war. Remember, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, he said, but you come into civil society and the social contract, and there are different versions of it, the Hobbes' version and Locke's version and Rousseau's understanding of it, but, but we would be safer that way. And yet, our insurrectionist school of thought has brought gruesome episodes of high-tech military violence into kindergartens and Walmarts and churches and synagogues and mosques and nightclubs all across the country. 
140 days or so we've had in 2023 and more than 200 mass shootings against our people, adults and children alike. And of course, the members of the Insurrectionist Caucus in Congress tell us you can't talk about policy reforms on the day of a mass shooting because it's too early. But of course, then we could never talk about it because there's a mass shooting every single day. They want to normalize the rampant gun violence, which makes us an absolute outlier among industrialized nations of the world. Even though there's so much effective policy change, we can get and we can have even within the understandings of a conservative Supreme Court. It is their extremist insurrectionist theory of the Second Amendment, which has never been adopted by the Supreme Court, that is blocking our ability to make progress. The Supreme Court has never struck down universal um, violent criminal background checks. It's never struck down the ban on assault weapons, which we had for more than a decade. And yet, my GOP colleagues will describe all of these as violations of the Second Amendment because for them, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to keep the public armed to the teeth in case we decide on our own to become a militia and overthrow the government. Well, um, it's time for the great American majority to stand up for the real Constitution and to take back the safety of our communities from these people. And it, it must begin by taking them seriously in terms of what they're saying about what the Second Amendment means and debunking it. There is no lawful right to overthrow our government, attack our police, or obstruct the counting of votes in our elections in America. The alleged rights of insurrection and sedition do not exist in the Second Amendment or anywhere else in our Constitution. We are governed here by our Constitution and the nonviolent social contract arising under it. It is time to reassert the primacy of the real Constitution. So. My friends, I uh, invite you and urge you to participate in this critical, momentous struggle for the defense of our social contract. I'm gonna leave you um, with the words of two people. One, the great Marylander Frederick Douglass, who said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And the struggle may be moral, it may be physical, it may be moral and physical, but there must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. There's a message to you from a great Marylander in the 19th century. And I'll leave you finally with the words of the great globe-trotting democratic revolutionary Thomas Paine, who came over to America in 1774. He arrived here two years before the American Revolution and fell in love with the promise of our country. He said that if America lived up to the democratic and freedom-loving ethos of the people, he said, we would become an asylum to humanity. Not an insane asylum, mind you. Uh, we would become an asylum to humanity. And um, in 1776, he wrote this beautiful pamphlet called The Crisis during the American Revolution when nobody knew which way it was gonna go and there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety about whether you really could establish the separation of church and state, whether you really could create government by the people, whether you could actually have a bill of rights and so on. And so he wanted to write a pamphlet to give people courage. And in it, he said these things, um, and I'm gonna just update the language a little bit at the instruction of uh, Nancy Pelosi, who said Tom Paine wouldn't mind, because uh, he was a feminist, but he said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country, but everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. Let's make that victory ours. Thank you, Usher. Thank you, Ali. Thank you.
Um, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Congressman Raskin. This has been amazing. And I just am so happy that you have been declared free of disease. I know it's been a rough year. I mean, America needs you more now than ever before, and we're so happy that you're here with us. And we are now going to open up the microphones, and I don't think there's any questions that are off limits. <laughs> Thank you for appearing today. Um, assuming the debt crisis gets resolved before June 5th, do you think it's possible constitutionally for the government to initiate a declaratory judgment action in court and finally get a determination that in fact the 14th Amendment as you described would control and that, therefore, by doing it that way, it's not interfering with the functioning of the government. Mm. It's a great idea, but I don't think the Supreme Court would touch that. I think they would, they would say there's not an actual case or controversy at that oh, point Sandy. if we resolve it. So I think that the court would say that, you know, that would be an advisory opinion, which they don't, they don't like to render. I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of people on my side of the aisle are regretting the fact that you know, we didn't use a brief moment in time just to repeal that statute, which, you know, has brought us to the brink of this, you know, of this nightmare. I mean, no, no Congress has ever pushed it to this point before. Uh, I think, I mean, this is quite extreme, but, um, you know, pe people, a, a lot of the reporters were saying to me this week, well, you keep talking about, you know, section four of the 14th amendment, but, Nobody's really heard of it before, and I'm like, well, you might not have heard of it. It's still in the Constitution, but, um, <laughs> but the, the reason you haven't heard of it is that no Congress before ever dared to try to drive the whole government of the United States over a cliff like this, but they did a government shutdown, and they did a violent insurrection, and so they were perf perfectly happy to do what Donald Trump was calling for, which was for a default, so we are going to have to deal with it one way or another. I agree with you there. Thank you, Congressman. If we the people are concerned about preserving democracy and protecting it, as we all should be, which presidency should we be more concerned about, that of Donald Trump or that of Ron DeSantis? <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's like a choice between gonorrhea and syphilis. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I... I mean, so someone, someone asked me, you know, did I think that DeSantis could beat Donald Trump? And I said, you know, it's like saying, could a candidate beat David Miscavige for head of the Church of Scientology? You know, it's operating like a cult. Donald Trump tells them all what to do. They follow his orders like theological commands. So I don't think anybody's going to be able to beat him at this point. And, um, you know, within the primaries. We're, we're definitely going to beat him in the general, but I don't think that anybody's going to be able to beat him um, in the primaries. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how they're going to resuscitate the GOP. I mean, it will take an exorcism, I mean, to deal with what's taking place over there. You know. Good evening. Given all the facts that we know about how f the far-right extremists in our country are trying to make the United States a totalitarian government, why is the Democratic Party unable to get down and dirty with the people who are trying to destroy America? And when does President Biden get on national TV and prime time and take these people out for the country to see who they really are? Well, I mean, I, I share your passion about the situation. I, I think it's, um, the burden is on all of us um, to be calling them out, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I, I try to call them out by taking them seriously. You know, a lot of my colleagues don't even listen to them, but when they get up to speak, I take scrupulous notes, and then I say, well, let's examine what you're actually saying. 
like let's engage and I see if I can get them to engage on it because I noticed this about the pattern of the the mass shootings and the massacres our side would get up and say what is wrong uh, with the government at this point I mean we're not taking care of our people and this is a nightmare and it's uncivilized and no country in the world is living through the kind of bloodbaths that we see now on a routine basis. And they get up and they say, there's nothing that can be done under the Second Amendment. So I think that that that's the point that we have to take them on about, like force them to defend that proposition. And shouldn't Joe Biden come on? Yeah, well, I, President, I mean, I think, look, there was reported unhappiness within our caucus about the fact that, you know, the, the, the MAGA element within the GOP was driving Kevin McCarthy to try to destroy social spending on health care and veterans and Medicare and Medicaid and so on. And we weren't telling the people what was going on. Um, and so we're going to have to do a lot better job of getting out there and explaining all of these tactics against democracy and freedom. Um, so I agree with you about that. We've just got to be much more aggressive and outspoken. And um, I mean, I came all the way to Western Massachusetts to talk about it. So I, you know, I'll go anywhere to talk about it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not just speaking for myself when I say thank you for your grit, your perseverance and dedication. <laughs> throughout hard personal times and for your good humor and not only for your gift of intelligence but your use of that gift in def defending our democracy. There seems to be a great lack of integrity in politics these days. Maybe we are just more aware of it because of the internet but I, fi I personally find it very discouraging. Can you please speak on reasonable pr protections that we can put in place in order to reduce the, gr the grift and dishonesty that appears to be running rampant, not only in state and federal, but local governments as well? Well, th thank you for your kind words. And um, well, you know, what one might have thought one could look to the Supreme Court to help us with that. Um, <laughs> but um, the Supreme Court seems to be a, an almost thoroughly corrupted institution at this point. And they have, um, they've basically defined bribery almost out of existence under our campaign finance laws while, um, you know, ravaging um, our understanding of uh, the First Amendment. So they've transformed every corporate treasury in America into a political slush fund in the Citizens United decision and opened the floodgates to foreign corporate spending um, in our elections. So um, I'm with you. There's a profound corruption that's been taking place of all of our political institutions, which again was something that the, the founders foresaw and warned against. Um, you know, and I would say to, to Justice Thomas what I would say to any number of people who've decided to, you know, go into public office and make money off of it. I mean, America's a great country and there are lots of ways to go out and make money, but one of them should not be going into public office, okay? Um, so, you know, there, there are two rival public philosophies now in the land. I mean, our party, um, which is the, the party of democracy, I would say, believes that government must be an instrument for the common good and the well-being of all. And the job of somebody who's in politics and government is to seek the common good the best that we can understand it. The rival public philosophy is the government belongs to the people who can capture it however they can through elections or th through anti-democratic means. And then the government is for their private personal enrichment or the enrichment of their families, the enrichment of their corporations or the class of people they represent. And that's a fundamentally corrupt view, but it's saturated a lot of parts of the, you know, of the public. And that's why now I aggressively claim the, de the mantle of democracy for my party, as many problems, you know, as we have in communicating, people never, never cease to tell me. Um, uh, but, you know, we, 
The, a lot of my uh, Republican colleagues will deliberately mispronounce the name of our party in its adjectival form. So they get up and they say, well, that Democrat Congresswoman with her Democrat plan and the Democrat uh, program and so on. And for years I was getting up and saying, actually, you know, the, the noun is Democrat, but the adjective is Democratic. So you've got to say the Democratic Congresswoman, the Democratic Party, the Democratic plan. And they kept doing it and doing it. And so one day earlier this year, I just lost my cool. And I said, you know, you've got this self-appointed political speech impediment, and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's contagious, it's spreading over to my side. Now when I try to open my mouth to say the name of your party, it just comes out the Banana Republican Party <laughs> and the Banana Republican Congressman. And uh, I, told my, I told my wife Sarah when I got home that night I had done this, I was very proud of myself, and uh, she said, well that was a very immature response. Uh, <laughs> and so I, uh, I had another idea because I was reading this great book by the historian H.W. Brand about Franklin D. Roosevelt called Traitor to His Class, which I recommend very highly. But in it, there are a bunch of Roosevelt speeches, and I learned something remarkable in that book. Roosevelt did not call our party the Democratic Party, much less the Democrat Party. He called us the capital D democracy. So he would say, well, you know, the the economic royalists and the plutocrats say you just invest in the very wealthiest people in society and some of the wealth will dribble down on everybody else, but the democracy says you invest in the great American middle class, we will all rise and prosper together. That's the doctrine of the democracy, he said. Well, today, um, I think it's time to dust that off because we are the party that believes in voting rights and that believes in free and fair elections and stands by the outcome of elections. We are the democracy today. And we're standing up for democracy in America and all over the world. In Ukraine against the Russian imperialist attack, we're standing up for human rights in every country where it's under attack. Uh, Donald Trump's best friends in Saudi Arabia, which was the site of his first foreign visit, are violating the rights of so many people in that society, and the Democrats will stand up for women's rights in Saudi Arabia, for the rights of non-believers in Saudi Arabia, and all, all over the world. So, um, yeah, thank you for getting me off on that. So, uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only sad thing is that you're not running for president. Uh, <laughs> so, you brilliantly, as of course, outlined two things that um, about dealing with the debt ceiling and dealing with um, the Second Amendment. Well, um, I'll get to that in a second. Have you <laughs> have you spoken to President Biden about the? Um, I think it was slide for, the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, the section fourth. Well, I've not spoken to him directly. I've definitely spoken to people in the White House, and this view is is definitely being made known. Um, and um, it, the problem was, here's the issue, just generally, and it's the same thing with the Second Amendment, that people are not starting off with the Constitution. Like, it kind of comes in very late, and so that's why all the reporters are saying, well, do you really think that the administration should exercise the 14th Amendment option? And I'm like, it's not an option. It's the Constitution. It's a mandate on us, okay? I mean, this is how we've got to analyze the whole problem. And, you know, I mean, we're getting into the same thing with DeSantis, who now has, you know, seven or eight things he wants to ban in the teaching of schools, you know, critical race theory and critical legal studies and things that he deems politically incorrect. And so everybody's saying, well, does he have the votes to do it and can get it done? And then, then they say, well, you know, what do you think about the First Amendment opinion? Or, you know, like the First Amendment should be the very first thing every American thinks about. That's a viewpoint discrimination. We don't ban whole schools of thought, even if you disagree with them in America. You don't ban books. You don't ban professors, right? And his whole, DeSantis's whole political platform is basically uh, Orban's platform in Hungary. It's illiberal democracy. Like we will mobilize mass support to go after targeted minorities, uh, but we will violate everybody's rights 
along the way, everybody's civil rights. So the other um, point you made in various forms was about militias are outlawed in every state. I was shocked to hear that. Private militias, yeah. Private militias. And you then connected a lot of things that politicians who are trying to overthrow a government, that's illegal. So who or what institution should be enforcing these laws? And thank you. Well, thank you. Well, um, first of all, everybody who's in government has a responsibility to enforce the Constitution. I mean, this is something that I raised at the impeachment trial um, where, you know, I, I said to the senators, you've sworn an oath under the Constitution to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's oath number one. Then they took a separate oath as jurors in an impeachment trial to render impartial justice, which is basically a synonym for nonpartisan justice. You must disregard political party and just look at the facts of the case, which is why, um, you know, I thought we were going to win 100 to 0. Um, it was 57 to 43, which was the biggest vote to convict a president in American history, and yet Trump still beat the constitutional spread. Uh, we didn't make it to two-thirds. We were 10 Republican senators short of having done that. But it should be everybody's responsibility to study the Constitution, explain the Constitution, debate the Constitution, right? Um, I mean, the Constitution does not belong to Chief Justice Roberts or the Supreme Court, or Justice Thomas, or anybody. It belongs to we the people. It's our Constitution. Um, and so we, we all have to fight for it. Um, and, um, and, and I think that we have to re-infuse our public debates with a sense of what the Constitution says. Right, well, I mean, and there's a problem that there, there, is, there are habits now of legal disobedience. I mean, Donald Trump is a one-man crime wave. I mean, he wakes up and he starts violating the law. And that, you know, and that has become a habit now within um, the GOP. So that's a really dangerous thing. And, you know, I don't know how we combat it other than to mobilize and arouse what I believe is the vast majority of the American people who believe in democracy, freedom, the Constitution, and the rule of law. I think most people are there, but we are up against a party that has a, a bag of dirty tricks, the gerrymandering of our state and federal uh, elections, the manipulation of the electoral college, which is now not just an antique and obsolete and undemocratic, it's given us five American presidents who lost in the popular vote twice in this century, 2000 and 2016, but it's also dangerous now. Because if you have a strategic bad faith actor like Donald Trump involved, he will use every outmoded nook and cranny in the process, as we saw in um, 2020 and 2021, um, as an opportunity to re, uh, revisit the election and even to inject violence into it. So how about we elect the president the way we elect senators, governors, members of Congress, mayors, whoever gets the most votes wins. You know, we spend, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year exporting American democracy and elections to foreign countries. And the one thing none of these countries ever comes back with is, you know that electoral college thing you have? That's really great. We think we'll import that. <laughs> To our, to our government. So maybe we could learn from the countries around the world and from our own practices. We should just have a popular vote and be done with it and not drag it out with this whole process. So. Thank you, Cong Congressman. I hope this question makes sense. Last night, um, Michael Beschloss mentioned that you can take Trump out of the equation. And Trumpism is so embedded in our network now, and it's gone underground, and he fell short of mentioning how other countries may be involved in trying to destroy our, our democracy. With the slide you showed, there were, um, anyone who aided an insurrection would not, should not hold office. 
how come no one was held accountable on the, on the GOP side, the ones that were texting Trump, et cetera, et cetera? So. Well, there have been various cases brought um, under Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. The problem is, is that none of the elected officials have been prosecuted or convicted yet. Um, now, I introduced uh, legislation with um, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz from Florida to set up a process in the federal district court of the District of Columbia to centralize all these cases there. So if there's an, a claim that somebody's running for office who participated in insurrection or rebellion, because the um, Section 4 of the 14th Amendment doesn't talk about... Um, it doesn't talk about having been convicted of, but just having participated in. So, but we think that there needs to be due process, but it could be civil due process to consider it. Um, that has not been taken up yet, but you know we're still hopeful that it might be. But the answer to your question is, um, you know, if Stuart Rhodes had been an elected official, he clearly would be disqualified um, at at this point. Well, Matt Gates has not been charged or prosecuted yet. There were a number of member, members of Congress, you'll recall, who we subpoenaed to come and testify before the January 6th committee, who just refused to do so. Um, so you can draw your own conclusions from it, but it is different from a criminal conviction or a civil conviction. And that, that's the problem that we have. We would have to act to create some mechanism for hearing cases about it. Otherwise, it's going to be up to each state court or each state secretary of state to deal with challenges to particular people being on the ballot. So we'll see if Donald Trump is actually prosecuted by the special prosecutor, Jack Smith, and he's convicted, then I think there would be an extremely strong case under the 14th Amendment that he could not serve. That would become a bar to him serving again. Hi. Um, Trump has a sickening amount of people that follow him. Especially, Trump has a sickening amount of people that follow him, especially in the middle of the country and the, uh, the south of the country. Um, and those gun laws, that's where they overwhelmingly sell guns. Do you think by any far... Thing they would think about a civil war now with all that, you know, he, I don't know how many followers he's got, but he has a whole lot of them, and they are in every state. So do you think that would be anywhere possible? So I don't know if you guys heard the question, but it's uh, about the, um, the lovely subject of a potential civil war um, in the country. I mean, you know, I have colleagues who have called for civil war or a national divorce um, and I, it's definitely part of the political rhetoric in some places that you find. Um, and, um, you know, the, I think that would be history beginning as tragedy and ending as a farce um, if they wanted to do it. And yet um, the same forces that are on the side of insurrection are also doing whatever they can to rehabilitate white supremacy and to engage in xenophobia um, you know, Lincoln, when he created the Republican Party, was a huge opponent of the Know Nothings, you know, the anti-immigrant Know Nothing uh, Party, and explicitly stood up for uh, immigration in the country. And of course, Lincoln and the Republicans were big supporters of non-citizen voting if people were on the pathway to citizenship, giving them um, the right to vote. Yet the, all that whole pro-immigrant part of the Republican Party is totally gone now, as immigrant bashing is so central to their political culture. So, I, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I don't, again, I, I like to think that there is a patriotic, patriotic uh, pro-democratic majority across the country, um, and that there are not states that will, you know, seek to secede. Um, you know, before the South seceded, there were people, there were abolitionists in the northern states, including in Massachusetts, who were calling for secession from the Union to break away from the slave states and saying that they were dragging the country down. And every time somebody on the other side of the aisle talks about national divorce or civil war, something like that, I hear people on my side saying, 
they're the ones taking all of the money anyway from the federal government, and our states are the donor states, and so I hear them saying the same thing. But then, you know, I hear Lincoln saying, the country was created by we the people, and it's an indissoluble bond that we have, and we got to fight for the union and liberty, Lincoln said. Union and liberty, they go together. You, met, you mentioned a few minutes ago, 2000 election and 2016, where the person who got the popular vote was not elected president. And when I think of that, I think of Ralph Nader and Jill Stein. There's a group going around now called No Labels that's looking to put a third party in every state. They're trying to get on the ballot, first in these swing states and then in every state. Whether or not that happens, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but knowing that that's a possibility and they're looking to put independents, one Republican and one Democrat, together as a team, <laughs> and knowing that if it was Donald Trump running against Joe Biden, Donald Trump's supporters seem to stick like glue a little closer and would less likely be siphoned off by a third party. And knowing how close the swing states could be and get affected by a 2% or 3% swing, and knowing that if the Republicans thought that this was going to hurt them, they would play dirty now and try to prevent this group from getting on the ballot. And knowing that many people say that Democrats don't play dirty enough, what could you do and what could your party do if you see this eventuality as losing the presidency to Donald Trump in 2024? Well, I agree with that question. Um, I, I, I mean, I can see where you're coming from on that. And I, I just, I think this is a, a deranged uh, vainglorious, narcissistic effort by somebody. I don't know who wants to run for president um, uh, against Joe Biden, who wants to equate Joe Biden with Donald Trump. I mean, is there anybody in the room who would be tempted to vote for that ticket? I mean, understanding what the stakes are, I just, I can't believe that there would be. Um, and um, incidentally, you bring me back to the politics of 2000, and I wrote about this actually in my book, um, Overruling Democracy, but when Nader did that in 2000, and it was interesting because Ralph Nader ran as a Green, but never joined the Green Party. He was an independent and uh, refused to join the Green Party. Um, but I wrote, I wrote something, this is before I was in you know, formal electoral politics, but I wrote something I think about six weeks before the election um, for, um, I think it was Slate magazine or maybe Salon, but um, basically advocating that, okay, if you want to make the point of voting for Ralph, do it um, in one of the red states where it's not going to make any difference. But if it's a swing state like Florida or Michigan or Wisconsin, that's a, you know, that's a very dangerous thing to do. So I advocated vote trading websites where people could go on the website and say, all right, you know, I was going to vote for Nader in Florida, but instead I'll vote for Gore, but can I find somebody in Alabama or Mississippi who's going to vote for Gore, who would vote for Nader? And there were like 25 of these websites that grew up overnight, like Gore for Nader, Nader for Gore, VoteTrader.com. And what was interesting about it was that neither Gore nor Nader understood it. And, and Nader said, I think everybody should just vote for whoever they want. And you know, who's in your heart? As if voting were like writing a poem or painting a painting. You know, it's strategic collective behavior. Um, and Gore pretty much said the same thing. But the people who understood the danger of it were the Republican attorneys general in the states and the secretaries of state. And they said this was a vote buying conspiracy. They were calling for me to be prosecuted for it. And they shut down these websites over the next several days, they shut them down. And something like 35 or 40,000 people did it before they shut. But of course, it's just strategic political behavior under the First Amendment. I mean, that's what a political party is, which is, well, I really support X, but if Y wins in the primary, I'll support Y instead of X. And, um, and it, there was one challenge in the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, of course, this is First Amendment protected um, behavior. But, I think there's something far more sinister going on with this uh, 
no labels effort. By the way, um, you know, the, and when I talk to the people who are no labels or the caucus in Congress is called the um, problem solvers caucus. Some people call it the problem causers caucus. Uh, but, um, you know, when, um, you know, I say to them, well, what do you guys stand for? They say, well, we're, we're moderates. I'm like, I thought you had no labels. Your label is moderate, but you know what makes you a moderate? It strikes me as a pretty extreme thing to do to expose us to another Trump presidency. So thank you for getting the word out. And um, you know, I, I am, you know, I'm not somebody who tries to keep people off of the ballot. Uh, I mean, if they're lawfully qualified to be on the ballot. Um, I mean, I think people uh, have a right to run, but I don't think anybody should vote for these people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, for, thank you for your strength and your leadership. Um, you talked about how, sort of my words, the Republicans can fight among themselves, but they're not going to beat Joe Biden. Um, I'm a little nervous because I listen to what's going on in places like Texas and the attack on Harris County voters and Florida, and Georgia. And I'm thinking, okay, the election's in a year and a half. So even if these, I'll call them aggressions, against um, some segments of American voters go to the courts, I know some courts are kind of a lost cause in equality, but is there time to rectify this before the election? And what can we do you know, we who live in other places, what's, what kind of course of action can we do to, to do something about this because it's so frightening? You're talking about the assault on voting rights and... Restrictions, yeah. The restrictions in certain places and you, you can't stand, in, you know, you, you can't get water, you can't vote on a certain day, you can't be driven to the polls. I mean, just things that are so targeted against Democratic voters, yeah. blatantly. Yeah. And they go through. It's like, how do you stop this so that people can vote fairly? Well, you're absolutely right. And I think that the defense of the right to vote and the defense of free and fair elections has to be an integral part of the Democratic campaign. And when there are states that are actively targeting people's right to vote, like in a number of states, they're now attacking the right of college students to vote, um, saying they really should be voting back at home, and then if they try to vote, vote back at home, well, they're not really living there anymore. And so, and I mean, the, the Supreme Court actually went through that in the 1970s in the college student voting cases, saying that there's a constitutional right that college students have to choose to vote either where they're originally from or in college if they have physical presence with intention to remain in that place. And yet we're gonna be going through that again and we're going through um, all of these uh, efforts to kick people off of the rolls if they miss one election and so on. And so, you know, given the American system of federalism, we're just gonna to have to go state by state. The Democratic Party has some wonderful lawyers involved in this, Mark Elias, to make sure that the party is directly involved. Um, and there are also great not-for-profit groups that are standing up for people's right to vote across the political spectrum. I mean, it really shouldn't be a partisan thing, but it does seem like it's a partisan thing who's trying to disenfranchise. I mean, I've never once been to a Democratic meeting where the people get together and say, all right, how are we gonna disenfranchise people who belong to that country club over there? You know, or how are we gonna figure out how to keep this group from voting or that group? So um, this is why I say, I think we are the democracy party. I don't think we plan to win by disenfranchising other voters. And it's shocking to me that it's Lincoln's party or former party, which now has as a strategy trying to disenfranchise huge numbers of people. But if you're losing in national elections by millions of votes, you can see why they start off with that proposition. Well, it's, it's in the weeds, legal work in every state, in every county. We know where it's at. And, you know, the good thing about this moment is we know everything that they're capable of and we know everything they will try, which is basically everything. And so we're, we're going to be ready for them. Yeah.
insurrectionists were li literally at war against our Constitution, why are they not prosecuted? What's the legal basis for not prosecuting them for treason? And some of them are just prosecuted for um, sedition. And second, could you please tell all of us how we can support your campaign for the Senate? <laughs> Well, although treason's in the Constitution, there, needs, there would need to be prosecution under existing statutes. Um, and um, so the Attorney General or the U.S. Attorney could bring that kind of uh, prosecution, theoretically, if they thought that there was the evidence to support it. But seditious conspiracy is basically the same thing. Um, and um, it's not punishable by death, um, but it is conspiring to overthrow the government of the United States. Um, and um, so, you know, one of the questions about like the prosecution of Donald Trump that has come up is, um, would it be too, div too divisive to pursue a prosecution if the special prosecutor came back with charges, or would it make us like a banana republic? I mean, the counter to that, of course, is would it make us more like a banana republic if we didn't prosecute a president of the United States who engages in uh, insurrectionary, pro-seditious um, conspiracy and activity, if that's what the prosecutors believe? Um, and. Um, you know, it's not a question that prosecutors usually ask. They usually ask, was there criminal conduct and is there sufficient evidence to prove there was criminal conduct? Not how much would people like this prosecution or dislike it? I mean, that's, that's pretty much, you know, an irrelevant thing. But obviously, uh, treason prosecutions take it to a different level. I mean, that takes it to the level of what, you know, happened during the Civil War um, where there were people who were deemed to be traitors to the country um, in what, what they did. So, um, you know, I, to my mind, that's a question of the factual evidence that's available. And um, if, I, if I run for Senate or anything else, Congress, you know, you name it, um, you'll all be hearing from me. So uh, <laughs> you, you just, um, I, I'll give you my card and send me your email and you'll never be lonely again. I guarantee it. So. <laughs> I'm already getting emails from you. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Bethesda, by the way. Oh, wonderful. I, by the I, way, do I have some other 8th District constituents in the house? Anybody else from Maryland? Okay, well, we got you, so there we go. Ever, so. And if you've ever stopped in at the Olney Ale House, uh, my brother has been your host. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've just That's led in my district. My, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've just led into my question, which is, given the fact that Donald Trump... Uh, claimed or said he was running for president early in order to frustrate uh, the law coming after him, and that the uh, Department of Justice has a policy, not in the Constitution, about charging a president, a sitting president with a crime, and they also have a policy about a prosecution too close to an election. What can be done? Well, the, the, the latter policy you identify is um, a, a few months period. It's not like a few years. I mean, we're always a few years ahead of an election um, in America. So it's, it's closer than this. And that, you know, there, there's a, a certain logic um, and sense to that. Um, but no, I personally don't believe that you can wrap yourself in some kind of cloak of immunity and impunity just by running for office. Um, 
which seems to be Donald Trump's plan, that as long as he's always running for office or saying he's going to be running for office, then he's free to commit whatever crimes he wants and nobody can prosecute him for that. So I hope the Department of Justice um, sees through that and I hope that they're aware of the various, I am certain that Jack Smith is aware of those particular parameters and boundaries. Um, but, you know, if you pilfer government documents, classified documents, and use them for other purposes and refuse to turn them back over to the government, it's a crime, just like if you incite a violent insurrection against the government and, um, you know, work to frustrate a congressional proceeding, specifically the peaceful transfer of power. All of those things are crimes. There are people in jail for it now. And like I said at the January 6th committee hearings, we cannot be a country which sends the foot soldiers and the ringleaders at street level to jail and lets the ringleaders in the suites go free. That can't be right. I can't believe we live in a country where Donald Trump is running for president again. <laughs> well, if he's convicted of uh, insurrection-related offenses, he will be barred. Let's only hope. Yeah. What can you do in the next 18 months? What can we all do in this room in the next 18 months to prevent this travesty from happening? Why well, do I have to look at him every other day on TV <laughs> or read about him in the media almost every day? Yes. You are an American hero, an intellect, a constitutional scholar, a public servant, a law professor. We want to hear you every day, not only to a super educated liberal audience, but to every ear in the country that you can avail yourself to be able to be listened to because you are our American hero. Thank you. Th thank you, sir. You, you speak, I think, in the first part of your comments, you speak for millions and millions of Americans who just can't believe we're in this situation, and I'm definitely in that group. But to me, literally nothing is more important in my political and professional life than making sure we don't uh, reenact the horrors and the tragedy that we just lived through. Um, we can't. So I'm completely with you on it. And I am committed to doing whatever I can uh, to stop that. And that to me is the overarching question in my mind as I figure out what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of years. So I thank you for that. Same question, but different audience. This week I was buying some uh, fences, fence material, and I had a chat with the general manager. And he said, I'm not gonna be able to get this in for another couple of months. We're so backed up, we have no workers. Maybe DeSantis can help. <laughs> Assuming he's not part of the, you know, the cult, how do you respond to somebody like that? And he's in Massachusetts, so it doesn't make any difference. But if he were not, and how do we reach out to somebody like that? Yeah, well, the, to, me, to my mind, the immigration issue is very similar to the gun violence issue, which is there are just stunningly obvious things that we could put together if we dislodged the political stalemate over it. Uh, one of my colleagues, Veronica Escobar, introduced with uh, a Republican colleague um, bipartisan legislation on immigration to get things moving. And right away, Kevin McCarthy said, we're not going to do anything until we deal with the border wall first. You know? So that it's you know, back to the border wall, which, by the way, I thought Mexico was going to pay for that. But... Uh, uh, but you see, there's the problem, which is we can't make any progress if the problem is defined um, in such an extreme way as to make it impossible to have any sort of bipartisan consensus moving forward. And you're right, we have, you know, we've got, um, because of the Biden administration, um, 
you know, one, maybe the best employment rate in American history, the lowest unemployment rate. Um, but we also have huge labor shortages in different parts of the economy. And we have huge labor shortages in the caring professions, for example, um, among nurses um, and social workers and, um, you know, the elderly care, assisted living facilities and so on. I mean, that would be a perfect opportunity to bring people into the country uh, who want to come here. And yet we can't even have an open, reasonable conversation about it without then somebody saying, you know, you, you want to bring murderers and rapists into the country and so on. So, um, you know, we, we got to recover, you know, where Thomas Paine was. Like, let's, let's find the America that wants to be an asylum for humanity and remembers that, um, that the most people in America today came here as immigrants, the people who are not descendants of slaves or American Indians. A, a great immigration success story starting in 1492 in America. That's when it all began. Thank you guys for your uh, participation tonight. Thank you.